The narrative begins with a customary evening excursion. Karen Reed and her partner, John O'Keefe, a police officer serving in Boston, gather with their friends at a local pub for a drink or two. As captured by the pub's CCTV, their interactions are filled with laughter, embraces, and an overall sense of joy. However, the night takes a tragic turn, with John's lifeless body discovered in a snowbank. The authorities quickly attribute his death to a straightforward cause. Karen Reed, in a state of intoxication, tragically struck her boyfriend in a vehicular accident. However, hold on a moment. The defense presents an alternative theory that sheds new light on the situation. Karen asserts that there is a vast cover-up underway, and it all revolves around a seemingly insignificant taillight. Brace yourself, because this case takes a wild turn, with every twist and turn leaving you in awe. Let's take a moment to recap. Conspiracy theories often receive a negative reputation. Granted, some are undeniably far-fetched, like the notion of lizard people. Yet, there are instances where these theories hold some credibility. Take the case of Jeffrey Epstein, for example. It's hard to believe that he took his own life. At their essence, conspiracy theories rely on the premise that multiple individuals are concealing the truth and are willing to go to extreme lengths to protect their deception. In Canton, Massachusetts, a small town located south of Boston, a local conspiracy theory has deeply divided the community. The crux of the matter revolves around the mysterious death of a police officer during a January blizzard. Was his girlfriend responsible for his demise, or was she framed for a murder orchestrated by his fellow law enforcement officers? The date is January 28, 2022. As the weatherman forecasts an impending historic snowstorm sweeping across New England, John O'Keefe and Karen Reed see it as an opportunity for a perfect date night. This resilient couple, hailing from tough New England stock, knows how to navigate through the snow, even after indulging in a few cocktails. It's worth noting that Karen, a 42-year-old equity analyst and part-time professor, brings her unique professional background to the story. Located at Bentley University, Karen holds a distinguished position. Although she owns a residence in Mansfield, Massachusetts, she predominantly spends her time in Canton with John. Their acquaintance spans several years, but their romantic relationship has flourished over the past two. John, a burly 46-year-old with brown hair, proudly boasts a 16-year tenure as a respected member of the Boston Police Department. He is deeply cherished within his local community. Furthermore, John is widely regarded as an exemplary individual. Around seven years ago, tragedy struck when his niece and nephew tragically lost both their parents. John's sister succumbed to a brain tumor while their father passed away from a heart attack a mere two months later. Without hesitation, John stepped up and wholeheartedly embraced the role of guardian, effectively adopting the children as his own. Affectionately, they refer to him as Uncle JJ. As Friday night unfolds, with the children peacefully asleep, Karen and John embark on their customary ritual of visiting their favorite establishments, where they enjoy the company of friends over drinks. The intended conclusion of the evening was to unwind at the waterfall bar and grill. However, fate had other plans when they unexpectedly encountered Jennifer McCabe, a friend of John's, at the bar. Accompanying her was Brian Albert, a fellow Boston police officer, who also happens to be Jennifer's brother-in-law. Brian is married to Jennifer's sister, and although John is acquainted with him, their relationship is not particularly close. These key individuals, Brian and Jennifer, will soon become central figures in a locally renowned conspiracy theory known as the Canton Cover-Up. It's worth noting that Brian Albert is no ordinary individual. He is a skilled boxer who has even made appearances on TNT's Boston's Finest. Leading the fugitive apprehension team, Brian is undeniably a force to be reckoned with. In other words, he's a certified badass. As the clock strikes midnight, Brian proposes the idea of enjoying a nightcap at his place, an invitation that Jennifer readily accepts. While John is keen on joining them, Karen is feeling unwell and prefers to pass on the invitation. Reluctantly, Karen agrees to drive John to the after party before returning to his place to spend the night. However, as they depart, John seizes a half-filled cocktail glass from the bar. A final drink for the road, he jests. John proceeds to enter Karen's black 2021 Lexus SUV, and they embark on a short two-mile journey from the waterfront. 
The events that unfold at the house are heavily disputed, leaving room for conflicting accounts. According to Karen, she pulled up to the destination where John exited the vehicle and approached the front door. The plan was for him to notify her via text or call, indicating that he had arrived at the correct location and whether he intended to stay at the party. Allegedly, Jennifer extended the invitation, but given their limited familiarity with the Alberts, there was a hint of uncertainty regarding their reception at the gathering. Essentially, the situation Karen finds herself in is similar to being invited by a friend to a gathering at their acquaintance's home. As she arrives, a wave of uncertainty washes over her. Will it be uncomfortable? Will she end up isolated in a corner, feeling like an outcast? His thoughts race through her mind as she steps into what she anticipates to be a family-oriented event. However, John fails to communicate with Karen, neither calling nor responding to her texts. After waiting for approximately 10 minutes without any sign of John, Karen decides to leave. Returning to John's place, Karen persistently tries to reach out to him via calls and messages, yet her efforts yield no response. Eventually, exhaustion overtakes her, and she drifts off to sleep around 1.30 a.m. When she awakens at 4.30 a.m., she finds herself alone on John's couch. John is nowhere to be seen. Concern grips Karen, prompting her to immediately reach out to Jennifer McCabe. However, Jennifer has no information regarding John's whereabouts. With each passing moment, Karen's worry intensifies. At 5.30 a.m., Karen, Jennifer, and one of John's lifelong friends named Carrie Roberts find themselves braving the treacherous blizzard as they tirelessly search for John. The darkness of the early morning and the relentless snowfall make visibility almost impossible. The biting cold adds to the challenging conditions, with the temperature hovering around a freezing 18 degrees. Faced with these harsh circumstances, they make the logical decision to return to Brian's house. It is during this time that Karen notices something alarming in the front yard, a body concealed beneath the snow. Driven by a surge of adrenaline, Karen swiftly exits Carrie's car and begins to frantically dig through the snow. There, she discovers John, motionless and frozen solid. Disturbingly, there is evidence of blood around his mouth and nose, along with visible abrasions on his arm. His eyes bear a discolored, swollen appearance, and he is missing one of his sneakers. The call to 911 is made at 6.04 a.m., and by 7 a.m., John is tragically pronounced dead. Now, here's where things take a peculiar turn. Despite the presence of first responders on the scene, no one from the house steps outside to offer assistance. The Alberts choose to remain indoors until John and Karen are eventually transported to the medical center. It seems rather unusual, doesn't it? If emergency personnel were attending to an incident on my property, I would likely venture outside to lend a hand. However, according to the defense motion, they did not do so. For reasons unknown, they refrained from doing so. At 9.08 a.m., Karen undergoes blood testing at the medical center. The results indicate that her blood alcohol content falls between 0.07 and 0.08. This testing occurs several hours after the incident, at around 12.45 a.m., which is approximately the estimated time of John's demise. According to the police laboratory, Karen's blood alcohol content at that time would have been around 0.03 to 0.04. Karen herself suggests that she had consumed approximately four drinks throughout the course of the evening. The prosecution contends that the actual time of the incident was closer to nine o'clock. During the police questioning of Jennifer and Carrie, additional details emerged. Jennifer claims that Karen confided in her about having a heated argument with John earlier that day. Strangely, Karen also expressed a lack of recollection regarding dropping John off at Brian's house. In fact, due to her heavy intoxication from the previous night, Karen struggled to remember much of anything. At a certain point, she even contemplated the possibility of having accidentally struck John, or if he had been hit by a passing snowplow. However, before the three women embarked on their search for John that morning, Jennifer and Carrie recall Karen revealing a cracked taillight on the passenger side of her SUV. Karen, unable to recall the circumstances that led to the damage, only knew that it was not present before she drove to the waterfall bar and grill. 
Upon arriving at the scene, a paramedic informed the police that Karen repeatedly exclaimed, I hit him, I hit him. As a result, the police have developed a working theory that seems rather evident. It is believed that Karen unintentionally struck John with her vehicle while drunkenly backing up after dropping him off at Brian's house. This tragic incident occurred three days prior to the discovery of John's lifeless body. The results of John's autopsy reveal a harrowing tale. His right arm displayed numerous bloody abrasions, while both eyes were swollen and darkened. A cut was present above his right eye, and a smaller one was found on the left side of his nose. Additionally, a two-inch gash adorned the back of his head. The autopsy further indicated multiple skull fractures, with John ultimately succumbing to the onset of hypothermia. Notably, the police discovered a shattered cocktail glass near John's body, the same one he had taken from the waterfall bar and grill that fateful night. Later in the day, the Massachusetts Special Emergency Response Team stumbled upon fragments of red and clear plastic scattered around the vicinity of the body. These fragments were consistent with the broken taillight of Karen's vehicle, providing additional evidence in support of their theory. As a result, Karen was subsequently arrested for manslaughter. Furthermore, authorities uncovered John's missing shoe, located not far from his lifeless body. Upon seizing Karen's vehicle, investigators allegedly discover fragments of glass embedded in the rear bumper, originating from the shattered cocktail glass. In addition, noticeable damage in the form of a dent, deep scratch, scratches, and chip paint is observed on her trunk. Among the evidence, they also stumble upon a single strand of hair. The nature of this hair, whether it is human or not, remains a subject of debate, much like many other aspects of this case. Karen, maintaining her innocence, pleads not guilty, placing her hopes on her lawyer, David Yannetti, to establish her non-involvement. However, an intriguing turn of events occurs as David has a peculiar phone conversation while on his way home from court. An anonymous caller alleges that Karen is innocent and being framed. According to the caller, Brian Albert and his nephew were responsible for assaulting John. Their intention was merely to rough him up, but when John failed to respond, they callously abandoned him in the harsh cold. Karen recalls a history of conflict between John and Brian Albert's nephew, as documented in Boston Magazine. She asserts that in the spring of 2020, John's alarm system had been triggered. In a swift motion, they hurried downstairs, where they encountered Brian Albert's nephew and a group of intoxicated teenagers idling in the front yard. Heated exchanges ensued, filled with profanity and aggression, including phrases like get the F out of here and go F yourselves. Perhaps, the autopsy photographs of John could potentially unveil crucial information. If Karen could muster the courage to view them, they might hold the key to her innocence. Upon examining the photos, Karen was horrified by the sight, perceiving them as indicative of a severe beating. David, too, took note of the marks on John's right arm, which bore a resemblance to animal bites, possibly from a dog. Interestingly, it was revealed that the Alberts owned a German shepherd named Chloe who was present inside the house on the night of John's tragic demise. The situation takes a more convoluted turn as we delve deeper into the details. State Trooper Michael Proctor, the lead detective assigned to the case, had long-standing ties to the Albert family. Facebook photos reveal that the Albert's nephew held the role of ring-bearer at Proctor's sister's wedding. Additionally, another intriguing figure emerges, the snowplow driver. According to his account, he claims to have been clearing Albert Street between 2.30 a.m. on January 29th, and at that time, John's lifeless body was not present on the lawn. However, sometime after 3.30 a.m., he allegedly spotted another SUV, possibly resembling a Ford Edge, parked near the exact location where John's body was ultimately discovered. These revelations give rise to suspicions regarding a potential cover-up. However, when Officer Proctor questioned the supervisor responsible for the snowplows, he reportedly received a different narrative. According to the supervisor, no plows had been dispatched to Albert Street. This conflicting information only added to the mounting challenges faced by Karen. Matters took a turn for the worse as her charges were upgraded to second-degree murder. The situation becomes increasingly complex, as it is one thing to consider that everyone involved was intoxicated, compounded by the snowy conditions, leading to a potential accidental collision. Contrary to previous beliefs, the police now held the belief that Karen had intentionally sought to end John's life in a drunken fit of anger. 
In June 2022, Trooper Proctor personally apprehended Karen after she had posted bail. Realizing the gravity of her situation, Karen understood that it was time to enlist the services of a formidable legal representative. If her suspicions were correct, she felt that the entire city of Boston was working against her. Thus, she required a lawyer experienced in handling high-profile cases. Enter Alan Jackson, a renowned criminal defense attorney based in Los Angeles, notable for representing individuals such as Kevin Spacey and Harvey Weinstein. How one interprets the association is subjective. Alan Jackson took a keen interest in the cover-up theory, and Karen, in her black SUV, aligns with his defense. The defense asserts that Karen made contact with the victim's SUV, resulting in damage to the rear, right passenger side taillight. The defense team further highlights the apparent movement of the victim's SUV, indicating a collision. As Karen drives away, they claim that evidence of missing taillight parts is visible. To support their case, the defense points to ring security footage from John's residence, which captures Karen leaving in search of John shortly after 5 a.m. on January 29th. Within the footage, a close examination reveals that Karen reverses her vehicle in close proximity to John's parked car. Her defense team contends that she made contact with it, resulting in a cracked taillight. They assert that this crack is visible as she drives away. However, the situation becomes more complex from here. The defense alleges that fragments from the shattered taillight were deliberately scattered around John's body after the incident, with the intention of framing Karen and protecting the police officer who owned the house. Adding fuel to the pro-Karen side, a significant piece of evidence emerges from Jennifer McCabe's search history. It is claimed that Jennifer searched for information on how long to die in the cold at 2.27 a.m. on the night of John's death. Technically, her search query included a misspelling, Hose Lund to die in the cold, with HOS being the incorrect term. Subsequently, she allegedly attempted to conceal the search activity. The search in question reappeared twice more at 6.23 a.m. and 6.24 a.m., following Karen's alleged instruction for Jennifer to Google hypothermia. However, is there any concrete evidence to confirm whether John actually entered the Alberts' house? Karen's defense team argues that data from John's Apple Health app indicates that he recorded 80 steps and climbed the equivalent of three flights of stairs after Karen purportedly dropped him off. They interpret this as evidence suggesting that John did enter the house where an act of violence may have taken place. However, individuals present at the gathering claim that John never made it inside. Although some party attendees recall seeing Karen's SUV parked outside and assumed that John had gone home with her. Regarding the health app data, the prosecution argues that such data is unreliable, as studies have indicated that health apps can be inaccurate by up to 33%. Regarding Jennifer McCabe's notable Google search, forensic experts posit that it occurred because she had an open tab from 2.27 a.m. However, she only searched for hose long to die in the cold after Karen instructed her to do so upon discovering John's body. It is worth noting that the medical examiner determined that John's injuries resulted from blunt force trauma rather than a physical altercation. Analysis of the data from Karen's car reveals that she reversed at a high speed on the night of John's death. However, the question arises, why can't they simply review the footage from the home security camera? Unfortunately, it turns out that there was no security camera installed, as stated by the Alberts during the investigation. This absence of surveillance footage leads to frustration, as one wonders about the whereabouts of these cameras when they are most needed. Perhaps, during the trial, the prosecution will present additional evidence, such as testimony from neighbors who might have surveillance cameras. It remains to be seen if this will materialize. The prosecution has already brought John's niece and nephew into the picture to bolster their case. These family members claim that the couple frequently engaged in intense arguments and that John had expressed a desire to end the relationship. Prosecutors assert that voicemails and text messages retrieved from John's phone indicate a toxic dynamic within the relationship. Following Karen's purported act of dropping off John, she proceeded to call and text him over 40 times, expressing her concern regarding his whereabouts and why he was not responding. The defense argues that this excessive communication serves as evidence that Karen is innocent. However, in one voicemail, she confesses her hatred for John which prosecutors view as a potential motive. 
Interestingly, a significant portion of Karen's case revolves around the alleged conflict between the Albert's nephew and John. However, the nephew asserts that he had left the house prior to the after-party on that particular evening. Moreover, individuals acquainted with both parties argue that there were no apparent issues between them. For over a year, the Karen Reed story remained relatively obscure, attracting minimal attention beyond the confines of Canton and Boston. However, Aidan Kearney, a controversial blogger known as Turtle Boy, took an interest in the case and published his first article, titled Canton Cover-Up Part 1, Corrupt State Trooper Helps, at around 3 a.m. on April 18, 2023. A headline Boston cop cover-up, murder of fellow officer, frame innocent girlfriend certainly grabs attention and sets the stage for the emergence of the Canton cover-up. Turtle Boy's viral article shed light on Karen's case against the Boston Police Department, Trooper Proctor, and all those implicated in the alleged plot to falsely implicate her in the murder. As the Canton cover-up gained momentum, the community became divided, with individuals taking sides either in support of Karen Reed or in support of the Boston police. It became a contentious topic akin to bringing up Donald Trump at a dinner party, where it was often deemed safer to remain silent unless one knew the company they were in. This theory tore apart friend groups, leading to the formation of pro-Karen rallies whenever she had a court appearance. Protesters at these rallies wore t-shirts displaying Jennifer's misspelled Google search, hose lawn to die in the cold. Turtle Boy's approach, which the police label as an ambush, involved confronting multiple individuals allegedly involved in the Canton cover-up. However, in October 2023, Turtle Boy himself faced charges of witness intimidation, claiming that the state was attempting to silence him. He asserts that he was the one being intimidated, creating a chaotic situation. The truth remains unclear. Could Karen have drunkenly run over her boyfriend? It is a possibility. Could John's fellow police officers have assaulted him and framed his girlfriend for murder? That is also a plausible scenario. The Karen Reed case is riddled with more questions than answers. Her trial for second-degree murder is scheduled to commence in the spring of 2024. The moral lesson of this story is that the truth can be elusive, and that conspiracy theories, while often dismissed, can sometimes hold credibility. The story of Karen Reed and the mysterious death of her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, highlights the importance of questioning official narratives and seeking the truth, even when it goes against the prevailing beliefs. It reminds us that there may be hidden agendas and individuals willing to go to extreme lengths to protect their deception. The case also serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of excessive alcohol consumption and the potential consequences of impaired judgment. Ultimately, the story underscores the need for a thorough investigation and a fair trial to uncover the truth and deliver justice.